majority of which I agree with. So let me um, start by telling a couple of stories, because I think in an effort to try to bring some of this home, it's important for us to recognize the effect that this is having on our children and our teachers. And the questions that were posed in the letter that was sent to us was the effects on students, the effects on staff, implementation issues, and then what should we do? Because um, it's easy, um, given the way they've handled this, for us to tell them what's wrong. Um, how then we should roll things out differently may be another question. So I'm going to start by telling you that I'm the superintendent of Comac schools. Have been, this is my fourth year. I also live in Comac. Two of my children graduated from Comac High School. I also have a four-year-old <clears throat> who is in pre-K this year. For those of you who have heard me tell this story before, I apologize. Um, she starts pre-K this year, and she was adopted. We adopted her a little over two years ago. Um, and we have a lottery system in Comac for our pre-K. And as a superintendent, I decided it probably was best for me to not put her in the lottery system. So I put her in another pre-K program. And she goes to school, and this is a kid who loves life, who is happy, articulate, bright, sunny, and fun. She went to preschool last year and loved it, loved everything about it. Started coming home within the first couple of days of school um, in pre-K and said, I don't want to go back to school. I don't want to go there anymore. Well, she's four. And four-year-olds love to go to school. It's been my experience anyway. And my other children loved going to school when they went through the system. Um, and very successfully, I might add, through the COMAC system under the old structure, off the college, off the graduate school, doing really great things. And I said to my wife, you know, we really need to go find out what's happening in, in the classroom and why she doesn't want to go back to school. You know, we'll give everybody the benefit of the doubt, but let's find out. So we go to open house, and then we have a conversation, and the teacher says, um, well, a common core is here. And the school is concerned about the assessments and the effect that it's going to have on kids, so they're pushing it down into pre-K. So they're implementing common core, um, not only the common core standards, which is one thing to have standards, but the curriculum, which is what's taught, and then thinking about how they're going to assess them already in pre-K. Um, she's no longer in that pre-K program. We removed her. Um, I will tell you, frankly, I, I don't blame the teacher, nor do I blame the school. Certainly, it's the system and the structures that are in place that are putting this kind of pressure on them to put in place programs that aren't appropriate, in particular for four-year-olds. I'll tell you another story real quick about a teacher. Um, they asked, they continuously say, well, we involve teachers in the development process of these assessments and the curriculum. I get an email from a teacher. Um, after I completed my student teaching in your district, I went on to make state tests for five years while teaching third grade in another Long Island school district. I worked on the park tests. In March, I was notified that 70% of the students would fail the test that I helped create long before the cut score was even established. I quit NYSED, Pearson, and Park. This is a person that they included in the process. And then one that, uh, yes, how it affects teachers in another way, a foreign language individual had a conversation with me, and she said, you know, we offer this authentic assessment component in our classes. Now, two of my children have graduated from the high school, went through the foreign language program, and I could tell you in all sincerity, they make fun of me at dinner because they sit there and speak to each other in Italian, and I don't understand anything that they say. <coughs> and they went through a program that was rich in authentic assessment. So the teacher says to me, you know, with all of the new assessments under APPR and everything else that's going on with the Common Core, we, we would, we're really worried about continuing this, this authentic assessment component because we maybe should put in a paper-pencil test. Folks, that's a travesty. That is not something that should be occurring in our classrooms. We should not be re removing authentic assessment for paper-pencil tests. And they don't want to do that, but they feel forced to do that. So I tell you these stories because the Common Core, and in particular the Common Core assessments, are having a significant impact on our students and our teachers. You've heard a lot about it here today regarding the stress associated with that. Um, that doesn't go unnoticed by us. Anybody who is paying attention knows that this is creating undue stress. I heard somebody from SED blame teachers for that. And I will tell you that under no condition do I think it has anything to do with teachers. We have teachers doing everything they can to minimize the stress for children, and the children feel it when they come in to take the test. So all of this educational reform conversation has been focused on teachers and teachers and, and how if we, just, if we just structure what they do, students will perform at a higher level. I'm here to tell you, and, and I have a, a, a degree in, in 
from New York University and my study was in how schools learn and in essence how do we engage teachers and staff in conversations that improve student achievement. Nowhere does it say we should give more standardized tests. So the standardized test component is really significant. I will tell you I believe there's another agenda. I'm not going to get into all the conspiracy theories but I will tell you um, I have spent time as a teacher in, New in Philadelphia, in inner city Philadelphia. I spent time as a teacher in inner city New York. I've spent the last decade or more as a superintendent, um, both as a community superintendent on Staten Island, uh, at out east, and then in Comac for the last four years. I have a pretty much unique perspective over what it is that um, is happening sort of in the back rooms and the conversations that are occurring regarding what people think is appropriate in different venues. What I'm here to tell you is it's not appropriate in any venue. It is not appropriate in low-performing schools, let alone high-performing schools. It is not appropriate. The research is clear. Engaging teachers in conversations about what it is that they want students to know, be able to do, and truly understand, and then identifying how you're going to know that locally. That is the work at hand. Over time, if there are state audits of what we do in, in schools, it can be really significantly further apart than every year. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some data. I'm going to really summarize my, my, my comments. I could go on. For those of you who have listened to me before, um, I could probably speak to you for about an hour and a half on this and just touch it. Uh, I'll try to do my best to finish it up in the next five minutes. Um, Common Core. It was intended to give some structure to a national conversation about what's known in schools throughout the country. It is ill-conceived. It is not appropriate to think that students in Comac should be at the same place at the same time around what they're learning as students in another district, in another state, or with significantly different needs. It is, it is inappropriate. Same thing would be true if we looked at the island as a whole. So uh, the Common Core itself, although the conception was to give some structure to, to that conversation, what happened was it resulted in a whole lot of other implications for us. Some of it had to do with the loss of local control. Teachers no longer have a say in what they teach, when they teach it, no matter the needs of their children, no matter the local resources. And that is a big issue for us. The overemphasis on high stakes tests. In grades six, seven, and eight, our kids will sit for 83 mandated tests for over 104 hours. I have a document here that was put together by my staff. It is seven pages single spaced of the assessments that are administered grade threes to eights as a result of APPR and the state tests. It is absolutely ludicrous. And others have said it here tonight, teaching is the goal at hand here and learning. Testing is not teaching. And in fact, it detracts from that. So as we move forward, what do we do? How do we have that conversation with teachers? There is, a, there is absolutely protocol in place that districts use all the time. I refer to it as top-down support for bottom-up reform. So teachers and administrators engage in conversations about good practice. What's working in our classrooms? What do we want students to know be able to do? What do we want them to understand? And how will we know that? And there are, there are things in place. We have our own database that we work on, which indicates these are the benchmark assessments that we use, that we value, that show student growth. The data is irrefutable. Students who graduate from COMAC go to college. Almost 100%, and that includes students with IEPs. So they are getting at what's necessary. And we can point to any number of districts on Long Island to do exactly the same thing. Struggling schools who may need additional resources or have social issues that they're grappling with don't need additional state tests to help them uh, support student growth and learning. So, so the conversation around should we keep the Common Core? If there are components of the Common Core that are valuable to a school district that are appropriate to what it is that's been identified for them to do, sure. There are components that are absolutely inappropriate. Some of them are too difficult. You point to them, we can pull out probably 100 examples. Some of them are too easy in a lot of districts. And our teachers are abandoning them. So we're put in a position where now we don't know, based on the high stakes tests, what they'll test. The purpose of testing is for us to get an idea of what students know do an item analysis, and then try to adjust what it is that we're doing internally as a result. That's not happening because they won't give us the information. So we're really at risk then because we're trying to cover this very broad curriculum of altering our program. So we're altering our program in ways that we're not comfortable with, that we don't value, and that exclude some other very important content areas. 
So as we look at social emotional, as we look at physical education, as we look at the arts, they are at risk of being abandoned because we're trying to focus on the assessments. No one wants to focus on the assessments, but it becomes part of the APPR score. Now, the state has said, well, the APPR score doesn't count. It doesn't count this year, don't worry about it. Only we're getting calls now asking for the teacher's APPR score. And parents are wondering, well, is, is that teacher a good teacher because the kids didn't do well on the state test? And we've done our best to get the word out, and our parents have been terrific in COMAC because they know whether or not the student got a two in fourth grade does not mean that they're not going to go to college. They understand that. However, if there are others who are saying, but wait a second, somebody is saying these state tests are good. I'm here to tell you they are ill-conceived, they're developmentally inappropriate, and they strip us of valuable instructional time and resources. So the risks are significant. Um, and, and by that, what I mean is aside from the fact that we are stripping out just to support the mandated AIS services that increased this year as a result of these assessments, somebody asked about cost earlier, we have hired $300,000 worth of teachers to give AIS to kids we don't think need AIS because of these tests. I mean, that's a really, that's a small snapshot, but it's $300,000 for support services where we could be using that in other ways, like the arts, like enrichment programs, like gifted programs, like special services for students who are in need of special services, not a group of kids who we have identified as not needing AIS, academic intervention services, yet we're mandated to provide those services for students. The research is clear, and I'm skipping through these pages as, as fast as I can. Um, we stand at the precipice of doing significant damage to our schools. There is, there is no doubt that we stand at the precipice. Uh, the unfettered implementation of narrowly, narrowly developed and focused standardized assessments that do not support the mission of providing a well-rounded educational system, educational program for our students is ill-conceived. Is Ill it's not going to work. Um, the idea that we're not including teachers in this conversation it is, in my, in my opinion, an atrocity, and I'm not pandering to the audience. Make no mistake, teachers need to be involved in this conversation at a deep level, at the local level. It doesn't have to happen at the state level where they bring in 100 teachers and say, well, we know what's right to do with the rest of the state. Those that don't agree, you can quit. The rest of us will figure this out and then superimpose it on everybody else. So I thank you for your time. Um, if you have any questions, I can entertain them at this time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. James. Uh, before we go to questions, I just want to acknowledge uh, our colleague, Assemblyman Joseph Saladino, has joined us as well. Al? Anything? 